caused that? It had nothing to do with your involvement with the the seaborne mission that to try to hamper rescue efforts of, of refugees? That, that wasn't cited as a reason? So the Defend Europe mission is an entirely different situation, and my ban had nothing to do with it. There's a lot of fake okay. news around that as well, though. So what's bizarre, though, is the social experiment had to do with Islam, and it had to do with uh, the LGBT community. Neither of those things have anything to do with race, yet I was banned for racism. I don't think the UK knows what they're talking about. Uh, clearly they don't, and they were just making something up to get me banned from the country because the government doesn't like controversial speakers like me. They don't like Tommy Robinson, who got put in jail recently. They don't like Geert Wilders, who also got uh, banned and wasn't allowed in the UK. There have been plenty of reasonable people who have questioned this multicultural policy in the UK that have just been denied entry because the government is afraid of being questioned, as they should now, be since they're betraying their people been... right now. Am I proud of being white? I'm happy to be white. I'm fine being white. I feel zero shame whatsoever for being white. If I say I'm proud, if I were black, I could say I'm proud. If I were Asian, I could say I'm proud. If I were any other ethnicity, I could say I'm proud because that's how our culture is. But if I'm white and I say I'm proud, the media will go nuts. ...and bludgeoned and tortured and raped. It is an absolute disgrace driven by their own government. The, uh, the uh, ANC in power are pushing for the reclaiming of farms, and this is let rip all sorts of malevolent forces. Uh, we have two fantastic guests. I want to go straight to them, and I want to hear from both of them the full story. You are not going to want to miss this, despite, as Ross said earlier, the Sydney Morning Herald uh, batting this away as some kind of alt-right nonsense that we needn't worry about. This is a hugely critical issue. Uh, we've got Andrew Hasty and Lauren Southern. Andrew Hasty, you will know, of course, as a backbencher in the Liberal government, a uh, former SAS officer. Andrew is fighting to have uh, white, African, uh, white South African farmers brought to Western Australia, where Andrew lives. And Lauren Southern has made a film, Farmland, about the plight of uh, South Africans. Welcome, uh, Lauren. Welcome, Andrew, to the show. Um, let's kick off, Lauren, with you. Uh, just tell us briefly the plight, and we'll get into also your fight for the farmers of South Africa. Off you go. Sure thing. So it's still shocking to me to hear people claim that what is going on in South Africa is some sort of alt-right conspiracy. It is something that you don't have to make up. It is demonstrably true. You can look at the statistics right now. White South Africans at a far higher rate than other groups, specifically farmers, are being attacked, murdered in brutal ways that are beyond just robberies. And it not just by the people in South Africa, but they are under attack by their government. The ANC has now passed through a law saying they are going to be taking white land without compensation, which is completely against even what Nelson Mandela wanted for the country when he said we want more blacks to own land. And you have parties like the EFF, run by Julius Malema, who have 10% of the government and they are saying we need to kill and shoot the boar in songs they sing at their Congress meetings. Not only that, Julius Malema has said he plans on not killing whites just yet. This is a direct quote from the leader of a political party in South Africa. So to anyone saying that this is an alt-right conspiracy, this is ridiculous pro-white nonsense, if this were being said about any other racial group in the world by a political leader, it would be on the front page of every single newspaper, Huffington Post, Independent, New York Times. They would all be saying the rise of Hitler is upon us. But because Julius Malema is black, because the ANC are a what seem to be, they're not a minority in their country. Remember, this is South Africa. Uh, because this is supposed to be the rainbow nation, we ignore it. But it seems Australia has taken a different approach. And while I believe Australia is taking the right approach, considering taking, it, taking in South African refugees, the world seems to be giving you heat. So, Andrew, <laughs> let's go. Thank you, Lauren. Let's go to Andrew. Tell us your thoughts on it. And is Lauren right? Are we doing enough? Well, thanks, Rowan. We've always had a very generous humanitarian visa program. It's run for the last four decades. We've been very responsive to international crises. We've taken Vietnamese people, Lebanese people during the Civil War, Albanians, Bosnians, Serbians, Croats during the Yugoslav Wars. More recently, just in 2015, we took 12,000 Syrian refugees, mainly minorities, Christian and Yazidi, which I was very, very supportive of. So in that context, 
Um, we've always been very generous, and on that basis, I'm cons that's why I'm advocating for, for the South African farmers, because I believe they do meet the, c the criteria for refugee status, and that is being discriminated against or persecuted in their country of origin. Now, if we accept the facts that Lauren just outlined, and of course we've had reporting in our own media from Paul Tui and others, uh, there was something like 400 attacks last year, something like 80 plus murders, and this year alone we've already had 15 murders. And I can tell you I've also got anecdotal evidence in Western Australia, Rowan, of, of people who've been directly affected by this, people living in Canning and elsewhere, um, and that's why I'm advocating for it. It's very, very disappointing, however, that as soon as you, you, you raise this issue, People accuse you of being racist, uh, and we Andrew, saw Peter Dutton during the week, the minister. Yeah, Andrew, we'll get into yes. that. I just want to quickly, so our viewers know, just some of the headlines. Farm manager tied upside down, hacked to death, wife raped. A farm manager was tied up with wire, repeatedly stabbed, hacked to death. His wife was raped by the attackers. Uh, murder so brutal that they shocked even South Africa. A couple shot dead. The son then drowned in a scalding bath of hot water. We've had a young boy forced to watch his mum being repeatedly and violently sexually assaulted. These are all, you've had emails, Andrew, uh, from farmers uh, talking to you about genocide, uh, talking to you about uh, the need for help, the need for another country to help. This is all happening. Lauren, talk us through the actual experiences that are happening that you've heard about. Yeah, I, I actually had the opportunity to speak to the woman who had to clean up the skin of the young boy who was boiled in that bathtub and uh, it's a group called the blood sisters they used to just be two people who would go about and they would clean up these murders these horrific murders where children were raped families massacred and they've had to expand basically and make it a, a full business where they've got places all over south africa with employees because these murders are happening in, at such exceptional rates i thought it would be difficult to find people to interview for my documentary, uh, who had their families murdered, parents, whatever it may be. But instead, the horrific things I found was I would meet one person and they would point to their neighbor there who had their mother's eyes gouged out, their neighbor there who had their children attacked, their neighbor there who was shot. It, it's shocking the amount of people who are affected by this, and it is not all recorded. In fact, if you look at these statistics, the government is recording a lot of these attacks not as the brutal murders that they are, but instead as robberies gone wrong. So this is another aspect of what could potentially become a genocide is the people trying to cover it up. I'm not saying a genocide is happening. I'm not saying that a civil war is going to happen or anything. But the point, the reason that we talk about these, the reason that our politicians address this issue is so that we avoid getting into that situation. And so we save people before things get to those extremes. And all of the signs seem to be there right now. American historian Henry Steele Cominger stated, the fact is that censorship always defeats its own purpose, for it creates in the end the kind of society that is incapable of exercising real discretion. In the long run, it will create a generation incapable of appreciating the difference between independence of thought and subservience. And that last bit is important because that's exactly what some people in this world want. They want people not to think. They want people not to challenge what they have said. There's a reason that now more than ever, the government and institutions are cracking down on free speech because people are starting to recognize the flaws in the institutions. People are starting to recognize that there are issues going on here with our government. And rather than let us freely address them, these governments and institutions divide, they censor, and they ban. And I know you've probably heard a lot about social media and censorship earlier from Adam Kokesh, but uh, what is going on in that world right now is so insane that I just need to touch on it a little bit in this speech. And beyond simply social media site censoring, actual arrests have been happening over posts on the internet, and it's becoming more and more commonplace. It's been about a year now since I reported and helped raise funds on the Gregory Allen Elliott case. Has anyone here ever heard of Gregory Allen Elliott? Yeah, we got a couple back there. All right, well, he was a kind Toronto artist who, uh, he did paintings and he was doing free work for a feminist organization in Toronto, and the girl on the right here was uh, one of the people he was doing work for. Got the nice little male tears <laughs> flask there, definitely not someone you want to work with if you're a man. But um, he got in an argument with these ladies that he was working with on Twitter. 
and I believe it was over, these ladies decided they hated this guy for making a sexist game, and they said they wanted to destroy his life. And this young man was around 18 or 19 years old. So Gregory tweeted back at them and said, I don't think that's the way we should go about it. I don't think we should try to destroy and take down people, maybe talk to him, especially when he's so young, he has a lot to learn. And Greg got in a little bit of an argument with these ladies that he was previously working with. Uh, and it eventually it got kind of to what happens on the internet. It just got to the bottom of the barrel insults where they're calling each other idiots and fat ass and, you know, everyone's done that on Twitter before. Now, <laughs> try to imagine this for a second. You just had an argument on Twitter. You're sitting down, you're having breakfast in the morning. Maybe a few days ago you got in a spat with someone on Twitter and, you know, you called them a dick munch or you called them something, something you say on the internet. And then you get a knock on your door and you go and you open the door and it's the police. And the police take you, they take you down to the station and they put you in a holding cell for three days and you're sitting there wondering what the hell just happened. What was it? Did they find about those modifications I did to my gun? Did they find about this? Like, you don't know what the hell is going on. And then the officer comes up to you <laughs> and says, do you remember at pussyho underscore 777 underscore bro? Yeah, last night you called that man a fat cunt on Twitter and you're gonna go to jail. <laughs> Just try to imagine that because that is exactly what happened to Gregory Allen Elliott. They literally arrested him because of his tweets. And if you don't believe me, let's just read these court documents. All right, so how was the contact with Mr. Elliot being different that has caused you to make the complaint to Twitter and to speak with the police and block your account? And this was the answer from one of the uh, complainants against Gregory. It's just the, the tone of his interactions, and forgive me because this was not recent, but I honestly didn't feel that they were they were, forgive me, it's hard to describe, but it didn't feel like so and so was picking on me. It didn't feel like he was picking on me per se, but I just didn't appreciate, you know, randomly being dragged into Twitter fights for no reason, or having his statements that were derogatory towards me, then including the hashtag Toronto Poly so everybody else was searching on the TO Poly tag could see his discussion. He was, he had deliberately added the tag so there was a wider audience seeing his type of attacks. This, this is what was being said in a court as a testimony. <laughs> and like the, the judge was, I went and I sat down in one of these things and the judge was literally reading and he's talking about hashtags and he literally would have to sit there and be like, smiley face, smiley face, underscore hashtag. And this was a, this went on for two years. It was <laughs> some of the most insane shit I've seen in my entire life. Uh, it cost Greg over $100,000 in legal fees and two years of his life gone to avoid jail. And the case just barely made it in his favor, just barely. He, thank God, he did not set that precedent in Canada because had he lost that case, there would have been a precedent forever set by that court that you could be arrested for offending someone on Twitter. Now, some are not as lucky as Greg, though, and they have been charged with hate speech, among other things. According to the online news site, The Register, a total of 2,500 Londoners have been arrested over the past five years for allegedly sending offensive messages via so 